Hi, good morning. I hope you all had a wonderful evening and, and mixed and mingled and networked and all then you know, slept very well and uh, you're all fresh and uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for another day. Um, again, if there's anything we can do at any point to make your you know, workshop easier, please let us know. We've got uh, uh, folks at the reception desk to talk to you any time. So, thank you all for being here. I want to uh, thank our panelists very much for being here. We've got a wonderful um, group of panelists set up for talking about insights into the publishing process. So, um, uh, I want to introduce uh, Becky Flowers, Chris Davis, Jeff Tyndall, and Wei Ching uh, Hun. Thank you, Pam, sorry. Um, and they are going to be introducing themselves, explaining um, what it is they, uh, their experience is about the publishing process. Uh, and so if you wouldn't mind just saying a few words about yourselves, telling everybody um, your experiences in uh, writing, publishing, and editing, uh, if you have experience in that, and then we can start and uh, take questions from the audience. Thank you. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Becky Flowers, so I'm now an associate professor at CU Boulder. I'm in the Department of Geological Sciences, and so I guess uh, in terms of my experiences um, publishing, at this point I guess I'm an author on about 40 papers and am the lead author or have one of my students as lead author as a, on about 30 of those. So I guess my, my experiences have sort of evolved, um, moving from sort of graduate through postdoc work now into being in a faculty position, and I think challenges sort of change as you move through time in terms of your time that you have available to write and sort of the um, different uh, sort of um, issues that you face when trying to usher students through the writing process versus writing um, papers on your own. And then I also spent a brief stint as an associate editor of one of the um, GSA journals. Morning, everyone. I'm Chris Davis. I direct the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Laboratory here at NCAR. So I've basically spent my whole career here at NCAR. Uh, so I've collaborated with a lot of different uh, groups and people on different topics over the years and written or co-authored a lot of papers uh, in various forms, all the way from students to you know senior researchers. Uh, I've served as an associate editor for the Quarterly Journal of, of the Royal Meteorological Society. That's actually a actual editor, they call it associate editor, but would be the equivalent of editor of a AMS journal. So I've sort of seen the publication process from that side, which is really interesting. Um, and I guess I'll save everything else for what comes next, whatever that is. <laughs> Morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Tyndall. I'm a senior scientist at NCAR and spent most of my career here as well. <laughs> and um, unlike most of the people at NCAR, I actually work in a lab with chemicals and things. So a lot of the projects we do are fairly short term and uh, you can see them through start to end. And so <clears throat> authored probably over 100 pa diff papers of different forms. And a lot of them have been with students and postdocs and collaborations. You know, students come and visit us in the summer for a few months and get some data. And we kind of write it up as best we can or they come back the next summer. So we get through a lot of data and have quite a few papers. Then for the, about the last six years or 2009 through 15, I've been uh, editor of uh, Geophysical Research Letters, GRL, which is kind of a fairly high profile, rapid publication journal of the American Geophysical Union. So I was handling between 250 and 300 papers a year, beginning to end. And basically, the editor, there's no associate editors, you do everything. You, know, you get the paper, send it out for review, you re read the reviews, make decisions, send it back for revision. So it's it's pretty tense at times, <laughs> needless to say, but you get to see a lot and you know, earn a lot of sympathy for the authors and the reviewers along the way. So that's my background. <laughs> I, uh, I'm Wei Ching Han, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Colorado, Department of Atmospheric Oceanic Sciences. And I get a degree in physical oceanography, and I have published uh, uh, articles from very specialized journal like JPO, whom you might know if you do Journal of Physical Oceanography, and two uh, uh, the journals like Nature Geoscience and this kind of journal like with broader audience for over 70 of them total. And so uh, editor, I have served as associate editor for six years for uh, JGR Oceans. I guess
Thank you all. So I'm going to kick off with a question um, for me, from me, um, and then uh, I guess if, if the discussion then uh, comes from the audience, then we can just see how that goes. So um, evidence shows that people who publish in high-profile journals for the first time are publishing with authors who have published there before. Um, what do you recommend to postdocs on how to get published um, and then finding those collaborators that they can uh, publish with? I think one of the important things as a, as a postdoc, and some of you are probably already well on your way to doing this, it's an opportunity to establish your independence from your PhD advisor. But there's also the obvious necessity to publish papers with your PhD advisor. Sometimes that happens in graduate school before you even finish. Sometimes that's still happening. But at some point, I think it's important to establish those new connections. and that, how you do that is uh, really it's an individual experience, but, but I would say that wherever you happen to be, it's, it's going to be up to you to seek out individuals who you think are prominent in the field, have a common interest with you, and invite them to collaborate. They may come to you, but they may not. And so I think this is really important. And I'm not, I mean, I think Carolyn's question was about this uh, specific journal. I think it's just useful to have people you're working with who do have that reputation in the field, you know, for a while. That, I think that helps get, you get contacts, it helps you, it may help get your paper accepted in some of these high, high profile journals, although I'm not so sure uh, about that. But this is an important time to make those new connections uh, so just put yourself out there is what I would say uh, in, at conferences or in the place where you work and try to talk to people and get them engaged in, in your work. It's really uh, it's a networking challenge and opportunity. It's both. Yeah, I agree. You know, go to AGU, go to AMS, you know, give your talks and your posters, and people you know, come to you and say, oh, we're working on something similar. And then you can say, oh, how's about you know, work, do something together kind of thing. But don't stress over the high-profile journals, though, I think is the thing. There's a lot of emphasis put on that when it comes to getting tenure. But on the other hand, you know, I see a lot of papers that go into high-profile journals that have been rushed. You know, it's a short format, often nature, science, it's just like a three or four page paper and people scramble to get the results out there and the results sometimes aren't the best. You know, so don't be afraid to publish in a good solid journal like JGR or something like that and uh, get a good re solid reputation before you start swinging for the fence. <laughs> Uh, first of all, you said high-profile uh, profile journals, and do you mean the science nature and with broader audience, or is, 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 could you tell me, like, is that that kind of journal, right? Uh, yes, journal. Uh, journal, okay. Uh, uh, I wouldn't see just go out to get this co-authorship, cool like you just for this co-authorship, cool because you're working on a specific field, and you know, you have to read a lot of papers. You know which paper, right? And you must have read some papers that published in Science or Nature or these kind of journals. If you think that person that can contribute to your work, and either from your own department or from somewhere else, you can always contact them, ask them whether they can, uh, they want or they are interested in your work. Uh, but I don't think I ever, intentionally just get somebody who has published this and just put, put the name there. No, I, don't, I have never done that. Yeah, I guess I would, I would uh, um, just add that, yeah, I agree that the, probably the most important goal is to just do good science and to publish in the um, best journals that you can. But the most important thing is to do good science and to establish your reputation in the field. And I agree, it's important to um, develop potentially some, some high profile collaborators, but part of the point of doing that is so that you can learn from them. 
And ultimately, you know, you should be trying to establish yourself as an independent scientist. And you shouldn't, I, I agree, not just have them on your papers to have them on, the, on your papers. Because sometimes those high profile people, they cast a really large shadow too. And so then it's a little unclear if you did the work or they did the work. And so ultimately, you really need to separate. You want to learn from them, but you also need to separate yourself from them. So it's not just, I don't think the goal is just to have high profile collaborators. You have to have a reason for involving those people in the science. Question from the audience, yeah. Hi, I'm Aditi Bhaskar. I'm at a hydrologist at USGS, soon to be at Colorado State. My question was about um, working with students who maybe this is their first time um, publishing a journal article, and how do you, uh, you know, you tell them right when they're starting the project that that's an expectation that this is going to go to publication. How do you work with somebody? who has never written a journal article before. And it's probably easier for you to do it yourself, but you're trying to train someone else to do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a good question for advisor. <laughs> and when you get a new student, they have never published it before. And of course, you start from like, giving them a direction and uh, ask them to read all the background materials. After they read a lot of materials, I'm sure they have a very good sense of regarding the science and let them pay part particular attention to how other people write it. So, and then I would always tell them that uh, we do expect the research result being published. But I don't push them, like, oh, you have to publish within a year or no. Yeah, I think a good start as well is just giving talks and little presentations, because that way you basically map out what the paper's going to look like. You have an introduction, you have a little experimental or methods, then you have results. So just standing up and talking about it in front of a, an audience, however small, really can help you. You, know, you have all your figures already there, and then all you have to do is put the words around it. It sounds easy, but. <laughs> yeah, I would say it, it has to start with the research. It has to start with the results. And I think if you're working with a, a student, I don't, I wouldn't, I mean, I have worked with students who haven't written uh, anything before, and I think it's an evolving process. I wouldn't set uh, an, uh, any kind of firm expectation about how it's going to end up looking at the end. I think it's got to be driven by the science that's done. When you get some results, then I think you can proceed from describing the results to growing it into a paper. And I think it just becomes logical at that point um, how to mentor the students through the rest of the process. Uh, but they have to have a core of results they're interested in and can describe before I think it's going to turn into a journal article. Yeah, I guess I, I, I always make it pretty clear up front that I expect the students to write a, a paper, because especially if you're an assistant professor, you need publication. So I think it's important, if, if that is your goal, to make it clear to them that that should be their goal. Um, but I agree, it's sort of an evolving process, and I think it's important for the students to come in and get their feet wet right away. I try to get them involved in research right away, trying to get some results, getting experience in the lab, and then also, um, uh, as some of the others said here, just trying to get them presenting information even just like in group meetings, and then just have them continuously thinking about the research so it's all moving in the direction of the paper even if they're not writing um, immediately. But I also think starting to write early, I always try to get even my master's students to start writing in the first year to maybe write up their background, maybe their methods to start writing up their results to create, generate some figures so that that stuff is done and then they can actually spend time thinking about the significance of, of their data. Because I, I think that's definitely, for me, has been probably the, the biggest learning experience coming on and being a faculty member is figuring out how to mentor students effectively and to get papers ultimately um, completed and, and submitted. And every student is different, so. So one of the things I found challenging about transitioning from grad school to postdoc was in grad school, I was encouraged to kind of work on my research for several years and really 
kind of solve everything about that problem and have a very complete full understanding and then write papers and publish about it, which is kind of incompatible with the short time frames of a postdoc and the need to get papers out and then I assume as you transition into a pr assistant professor position as well, you need to you know, be productive. And so I was wondering if you could comment on this balance between you know, having papers that are very comprehensive and sort of good quality, all encompassing about a problem versus a higher sort of quantity of publications. I know to some extent quality over quantity is important, but you also do need a certain amount of publications. So if you could come in and sort of how to tell when you have enough for a paper versus when you should kind of keep going and that kind of balance. That is often the ultimate question in publications, is, is when do I stop and when do I say that this is enough? So a um, long time ago, I worked with a fellow named Brian Farrell from Harvard University. I didn't really write papers with him, but he had a very, very distinct philosophy, which is one idea, one paper, that's it. And well, you know, I guess the question is, what constitutes an idea? But I think what he was saying, he tended to write you know, papers in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences that ended up eight pages long. They were theoretical, so that may have helped him, as opposed to describing detailed uh, laboratory experiments or, or numerical models. But nonetheless, I think this idea of one, one idea, one paper is, is a useful guiding principle. If you find you're trying to describe two major results, you probably have two papers. And I think at that point, it's OK to consider it as two papers. Uh, but if you really have one theme and it just takes, or one major idea, and it just takes a lot of description and background to actually to accurately get that idea out there, that's one paper. So, you know, there's no, as you could, could guess, there's no hard and fast rule about this. But I think it's, it's useful to, to try to make your paper on about one thing and, and see where that leads you. <laughs> I think that's an excellent question for, uh, for every poster, every poster who is starting his or her career and want to be a faculty in the future or a scientist, and you are pressed by quality versus quantity or productive. Productivity includes quantity, okay? So I strongly suggest you don't sacrifice all the quality just for quantity. However, I do understand, because I went through that process, I do understand you're stressed by productivity. So from this point of view, I think it makes sense if for some topics, and if you think, oh, this is a good idea, and, but I won't have the time for a year or two to finish the whole comprehensive process. So from that point of view, you can write something like, oh, good idea, but I need more time. But if you put it there, you're going to wait for one, two years. No, I would suggest you to publish something like GIL, geophysical research letters. It's only four pages, and just publish it. And then if you have time, you follow on, or you move on to other projects. I would do that. So that's a kind of quantity or you know, point of view. But I think your whole career reputation as a good scientist is based on quality. Okay, it's mainly based on quality for your whole career. But in order for you to get to that path, okay, to be a faculty, they look at your how many people have published, also quality. From this point, of course, you need to work hard. <laughs> okay, of course, if everything is high quality, every single paper, that's marvelous. But many times, as I said, you do some very good ones, thorough, and some ones you don't have time to put your hands on for details, and, but you have a good idea, get it published, so you get a balance between the two. I, 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 I also agree that's an, excellent, um, that's an excellent question, and I feel like that is another really big challenge when you get to be, uh, in particular, like an assistant professor, and um, just find, trying to decide on the boundaries between different publications and what the distinct contribution that each will make. And I think sometimes, as it's sort of been said here, that to think strategically about what is going to be the most, you're going to get 
more immediately, like what can you actually complete and make a good contribution with in the short term and balance that against the long term. Because particularly once you become an assistant professor, you will be much more busy than you are even as a postdoc and you will have much less time. And so it'll be important, it's been really important for me to be able to work on multiple papers at the same time with different students and so just balancing the time. So I think a lot of it is just thinking strategically because it is critical to maintain the quality and you don't want to just shingle papers on the same idea, but uh, you also have to be consistent in, in publishing. Um, so yeah, so you need a balance. Hi, Julia Buck from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, my question is, as an author, what can I do to make the job of an editor easier? nice <laughs> so yeah I think you know it's going back to the previous question a little bit too you know if you're thorough and uh, do good science but I think also being concise when you're writing papers you know you need to be get as much detail in there as is necessary to explain what's going on in the paper and uh, but you also you know, have to be kind to your reviewers as well and not analyze every little wiggle in your data and everything like that. You know, go for the big overall picture and um, just you know, realize that editors and reviewers are humans. You know, they make mistakes, as do authors too. And uh, I think it goes both ways. You just have to kind of be reasonable, don't make any enemies, and uh, just kind of work through it in a logical, sensible way. And I think the, the inverse applies to if you're reviewing as well. You know, don't pick a personal battle with somebody, you know, ultimately the quality of the paper relies, you know, reflects on the author. So if you have two rounds of reviews on a paper and you still don't like it, just send it back to the editor and say, if you want to publish it, that's fine, but ultimately it's going to look bad on the author. So quality <laughs> over quantity, again, <laughs> I think is the, the bottom line. I can add to that a couple of things. Uh, clarity of exposition, clarity of figures, uh, a well, uh, a spell-checked, grammatically uh, correct paper really helps because there's nothing that's worse for a reviewer to get than something that has obvious errors and the figures are hard to read and you know there's 67 different contours on a particular plot and. Uh, stuff like that. So you can really help that process. But I want to also address the review end of things because I think one of the most challenging things for an editor is when reviewers are trying to be helpful and the author will not let them. Uh, and there, I've encountered this a number of times and it's a balance between defending your point, defending what you have written, this is what I really believe, and being at least somewhat accepting of, of the critique that's coming in the reviews. And I think strike, offering to strike a balance there on the part of the author really helps the review process. You don't want to compromise your basic principles. You, all, you do want to stand firm, but you don't want to just uh, reject what the reviewers are saying just for the sake of that. I think that complicates the editor's job. <laughs> Yeah, just to, to add to that, I think, yeah, I mean, it takes time to review a paper, right? And so, um, and to spend time to read it and try to give constructive criticism. And it's very frustrating as a reviewer if later you see that paper and you realize, oh, I spent all this time in this review and they accepted none of my comments. <laughs> they just completely ignored them. And, you know, you get a reputation for that too. So, I mean, typically when you get a review, I mean, again, yeah, you don't have to accept everything that the reviewer says, but on the other hand, they probably, there's probably some wisdom in there and ways that you can improve your paper. I often get lots of helpful um, comments that definitely improve my paper through the review process, and I find it very helpful. So I think you, you know, that's again a part of developing your reputation as being someone who is open-minded, and when you see an opportunity to improve your paper as a consequence of the review process to do that, and to express appreciation too when you write a letter back in response to the reviewer comments saying, thanks, this was helpful, and here's the changes that we made, rather than just saying, oh, well, I know what I'm doing, and you're wrong. <laughs> and just remember that these people are reviewing your papers now, but in six or seven years, they might be writing letters of recommendation for your tenure. 
So. <laughs> okay, first of all, uh, I just want to add on to what he said. Uh, what he said, all oh, very uh, great uh, suggestions. So one point, I do have a story about it. Sometimes you do get a, a question from the reviewer that it doesn't make sense. Okay, it does not make sense because they didn't fully understand the dynamics. One story I get that one time is the reviewer just couldn't understand, just confused about the concept of geostrophy, uh, a geostrophy and a quasi geostrophy. They are completely, completely different concepts. So keeps asking, it's quasi geostrophy, keep asking a geostrophy. At first, he's like, oh, that's what kind of, oh, confused, okay. Just be calm, and you should think that all the review reviewers, they're spending time, and they're trying, they have good intention. If they are confused, don't just say, I'm mad, I'll write a letter to the editor. No, just try to explain what exactly it is. So I try to explain what is the concept of geostrophy, what is the quasi geostrophy, and the paper admitted right away. Okay, um, I have a question about publishing strategy during, uh, during the, the, the term of the postdoc. Um, in some cases, but not all cases, um, you have a calibration component that may actually take the full duration and, and re realistically and then some, but at least the full duration, if not the first year of the postdoc, and then perhaps a paleo component, some sort of a reconstruction. Um, and you know, so all of a sudden that probably necessitates some fancy strategizing and maneuvering in order to be able to publish the whatever recommended quantity of, of papers that uh, that should go along with a postdoc. I, I don't know if there are any recommendations on, on how to deal with that. So obviously you kind of have to force something. I think you put a quick paleo paper up front without any calibration and then perhaps produce the calibration paper after your postdoc. I don't know if you've encountered this. <laughs> no, we see that too. It, instrument development, same kind of thing. You know, have someone come in and work on an instrument, take a little while to build it, then you go in the field, and then once you get back from the field, you have to start analyzing mounds of data and things. So it's not uncommon in several fields. And uh, yeah, I think maybe, yeah, as you suggested, an experimental paper sometimes takes longer than a results paper, but uh, then there's a always a game knowing how much detail to put into the, the shorter paper and still make it clear. Because as we say, you really don't want to lose any of the information that the reviewers might need to be able to review a paper. So I think that's the, the key, is in making sure you can really have enough information out there to, to get people to evaluate the work correctly. But it, it is a problem with postdoc positions. You know, just if you building something and developing it, it's going to take a chunk of your time. But it's, you really just got to you know, trust your advisor, really, in that sense. So they're going to look out for you and try and get you some publications in a reasonable amount of time. But probably best advice. So. I, I guess one thing I might add to that is that hopefully if you haven't actually published all of your papers from your PhD, then you can keep rolling those out during your postdoc so that then by the time you finish your calibration study that that will then come out. So hopefully you have some overlap and some continuity there. Hi, uh, Falco Jude. Uh, I'm an ASP postdoc here in MCUBE at NCAR. Um, I have a question regarding, you submit a manuscript, you get back the revisions, uh, the reviews, and um, are you, or can you uh, change parts of the manuscript that, wasn't, that weren't commented on by the reviewers to make them better? 
So we're all a little bit perfectionist, right? And sometimes I submit a paper, get it back, and I want to change things, but the readers were okay with that. I don't think there's a problem with that. The one thing you want to be aware of is that the reviewer might go, wait a minute, I never saw this before, and so you may get comments on the part you changed. But I think, I think you should always look to improve the paper. If you see something obvious, even if the reviewers didn't see it or didn't notice it, didn't comment on it, I would go ahead and change it. I think there's no problem with that. Yeah, definitely. And even, you know, I've seen papers come back with different sets of authors even. You know, they add people or even sometimes the reviewer. You know, if, if it's a kind of friendly review, then they'll contact the author or vice versa. And then the author will invite them to become a, an author on the paper the second time around. And so, you know, anything to improve the paper is, is good, yeah. Hi, my name is Colin Phillips. I'm at the uh, University of Minnesota. <clears throat> I have a question for the uh, editors, um, in a particular case, but also just in general. So when to involve the editorial staff when you are responding to reviews, where it's clear, and I mean actually clear, that the intent of the review you're responding to has gone from, you know, like a review where you'd give them a benefit of the doubt to a personal attack. You know, when do you say, this is no longer about the science, and I don't really want to, you know, play a game here. I just, you know, when do you say to the editor, "Hey, look, this seems to be beyond the pale." Well, that's always tricky. I guess one thing I always try to do is limit the number of back and forth iterations that occur, and at some point, simply. Uh, tell the authors, here's what you need to do, and if they do it, that's it. And we just don't keep going back and forth about this, because you can end up, there are, right, there are some people that are never going to agree uh, on certain points, and I think that's the editor's job, is to own that review and make that decision and decide when enough is enough. And, and so I think when editors do that, everybody appreciates it, because the reviewer is done, the author sees the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, and it's, but that means you have to make a decision about is this, should this paper be published, first of all. Once you've made that decision, then I think that's, then you can guide that process from there as the editor. No, I agree totally, and uh, like, you know, sometimes after, yeah, probably after a second review is probably the time to call a halt, and sometimes the authors will just write and say, hey, could I have another reviewer look at this or something? If they're just two, they'll ask for a third reviewer just to take a look. But I mean, as Chris says, a strong editorial hand is really important you know, for the editor to understand what's required and draw the line somewhere. Um, <coughs> what I would do, yeah, I agree with um, First of all, I think what I would do, I'd, I'll read both of this and all the messages carefully because the editor is supposed to be, at least know a lot in this field. So most likely I can make the decision, but if I cannot, there's too much details that's out of my background, I would get a, another reviewer. So I'm just wondering if there's ever a situation where you would contact, you sort of alluded to this, con if you have some contribution as a reviewer to make, would you contact the authors offline sort of to avoid a long description of blah, 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 do this, 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 this different, and then how would you go about that? And I, I guess also, you know, given that the position that we're all postdocs and how that sort of fits into our careers and You mean a situation where a reviewer has relinquished their anonymity, and so you, the author knows who the reviewer is, and uh, I guess I haven't taken it upon myself to initiate offline communication, but I know that in my case as an author, if I know the 
reviewer, I might contact them. Or as a reviewer, if I'm relinquishing my anonymity, I might send an email separately to the author saying, hey, these are my points. I like your paper, but I, this really, you know, let's talk about this. So I guess as an editor, I haven't myself encouraged that. I think it usually takes place between the author and the reviewer. I hope I'm addressing your question. Yeah, I, I've seen that as an editor. Sometimes the reviewer will say in a little private note, hey, you know, is it okay if I contact the authors or something like that and give up their anonymity that way? And uh, if I'm reviewing myself, 50% you know, of the time I'll waive anonymity anyway, yeah, depending. But I, I, I kind of often sign reviews just so the authors know who it is, and then that opens up the possibility for dialogue as well. But uh, yeah, sometimes it goes like through the official journal channels, but it's mostly up to the reviewer to contact the authors in general, I think, because the authors don't always know who the reviewers are. I think. Yeah. But uh, I think it's a good thing, yeah. So, and often that will you know, result in offer of co-authorship as well, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I would say that I've, I've um, also sort of informally, uh, as an author of a paper on which I've received reviews, just um, informally contacted the reviewer of the paper because the further along you get in your career, the more you know other people in your field, and so uh, you get to know these other folks better. And they're kind of uh, they might be reviewing your paper, but you've interacted with them a bunch, so it's easy enough just to say, "Hey, thanks for the review. You made some good points," or "What did you mean by this?" And recently, I, there was a paper in which um, the, one of the reviewers, he had a different expertise, and one of the suggestions by the editor was to consider adding a person with that expertise to the paper. So we actually went and invited him to become an, a co-author on the paper, and he ultimately did, although he was initially the reviewer of the paper. And I think it strengthened the paper greatly. So I think those offline interactions can be very um, effective. Hey, I'm Allison Nijins. I'm a PRF here at NCAR. And um, my question is related to the review process. Um, it's two, two parts. One is, how long do you think spending on a review is worth it? I often find that I spend way too long on reviews. And I know I shouldn't write it for them, but maybe I do. And then secondly, um, sometimes it's obvious, minor or reject. But often the border between minor and major is really vague. And sometimes I don't know what to suggest. Do you have some clear guidelines on when a paper is minor revisions or when a paper is major revisions from the reviewer point of view? <laughs> so uh, let's see. The, the uh, difference between major and minor, if you're recommending changes, I think as you suggest, it's kind of a, it's very gray in a lot of instances. I think if you feel that this is going to take the authors a while to, to figure out, they got there's something they actually have to go do to satisfy your comments, whether it's conduct another another experiment, reanalyze data in in some way, it's not something they're going to pull off in a few days. I would say that that probably a major revision. You could at least suggest that this is probably a major revision. Ultimately, the editor might see that comment and, and, and say, well, actually, no. I know these people. They'll probably deal with this pretty fast, so it, they would call it minor. It is tricky, though, because once uh, there's a temptation on the, OK, I want to be careful how I say this. Uh, on auth the, a part of authors I've seen, there's a temptation that when they say, when they see minor revisions in the recommendation that, oh, I don't have to do anything now. You know, the paper's fine. And that's really not the intent. So I think the other, one of the motivations for saying major revision is to get people's attention that, no, this is actually an important thing that you really need to address. As to how much time you should spend on a review, not more than a day. That would be my recommendation. Uh, and maybe even, it, it depends, you know, obviously if you've got a two-part paper to review, that's going to take a while. If it's something that's kind of on the edge of your field or a really technically complicated paper, that's going to take a while. But mo 
most of the time, I think it's a, it's basically a day. It shouldn't be more than that. Others may disagree. Um, I would say, uh, Chris said, uh, more, no, more, no more than a day. That's my time now. But when I was a postdoc, I spent three days for one paper. That's very normal, sometimes four days. Why? Because you don't, because you don't know all the references they cited. I would go to a lot of those references <laughs> and read them all because I feel like uh, so far now, don't rush to limit yourself the time one day or something. And even if it takes you a week, you should do a good job. And uh, for now, I think I was able to, because you accumulate, we are much older than you are, you know that. <laughs> so you accumulate all the experience and all the references in your field. I guess you can do it faster now. But uh, when I was a postdoc, I did spend typically three days. No, reviewing is a wonderful part of the learning process. It's a vitally important thing that we all do, and I, I still enjoy it. I remember the first time my professor came down in grad school, he was just swamped and said, oh, could you take a look at this book and you know, maybe review it for you? I'll let the journal know you did it. And I was so, oh yeah, I can do that. Yeah, sure, sure. And then it's like a four-page paper. And I don't know how long it took me to review, but uh, it, was, it was just it was so cool to be part of that process early on. and. Uh, yeah, I agree. You, you know, a day or two, whatever it takes. I think the important thing is not to rewrite the paper for the authors. You know, do what you have to do to get the things across. And you know, these days, I, I actually get a little harsh. You know, if I look at a paper and see it's not going to make it, then my review is very short because. Unfortunately, you know, if you kind of say, you yeah, know, this paper is probably not suitable for publication, then you give four pages of minor comments, the authors will correct the typos and ignore the comment that it's not suitable for publication, and it, you get it back two weeks later. So, you know, be honest, be blunt, and you know, don't spend hours and days working on a paper that you don't think is suitable. But, uh, but, but be thorough as well, and it, it's a great learning process, as Wei Chun said, and uh, it's good opportunity for you to learn what's going on in the field and how other people think. So you know, give it the time it deserves, I think, is probably the answer. I actually have a question about when you, um, when you agree or decline to review a paper, because there have been situations in which I've been asked to review a paper that's on the very periphery of, you know, of, of my area of expertise. And I probably could have done it. It would have taken me quite a long time to just get up to speed on that. Um, and I've had other situations in which I've been completely snowed under by other things. And I really feel I should, because I feel it's my duty to do this. But at the same time, I know I don't necessarily have time to do a great job. So what's that, where's that line drawn? And when, when, you know, how often can you decline before people get angry with you? <laughs> um, so I guess I, I would say for me personally, when I was uh, a postdoc and just starting to review, I uh, pretty much set, accepted all the reviews sent my way, <laughs> just so I could learn and see, because uh, I was totally new to the process. Now, you know, I get requests for maybe 40 or 50 reviews a year, and so I'm very, much more selective, and so now I accept reviews when I... Um, feel like I am particularly well qualified to review it and I know for example that in, in my particular field Maybe there's only a half dozen other people who have that level of expertise in this particular area Or if it's an area that I'm specifically working in and I'm very interested in um, the particular problem and um, The third reason I accept reviews is if it's sort of like that. I know the editor and maybe uh, and let's say I just recently submitted a, a paper to that journal and uh, and he handled it, and then that editor now is asking me to review a paper, I'll always say yes, because I have to, you know, return the favor. Or if, like, the person just recently, like, invited me to give a talk somewhere, did me a favor, then, you know, it's sort of you're doing them a favor in return. And in those cases, I always say yes, even if the paper is a little bit out of my field. And so that means, I don't know, I'll, I'll review maybe a couple dozen a year now. So somewhere someone told me that... There's, the, there's a guideline sitting out there somewhere about reviewing roughly three times the number of papers you write. I have no idea if this is a reasonable 
number or not, and it's not necessarily a number I subscribe to, but I think it's, it is reasonable to try to bound this. Uh, I think Becky's comment was really good about, yeah, when you're starting out, you kind of want to review everything. And when you get to, like, at this point, I don't have time to review much of anything, so I, I end up saying no a lot. I guess if you stand, I, I would say, if you stand a chance to really learn something by, by reviewing a paper, that's a really good reason to do it. That means you must be part, have expertise in that field, but also, you know, uh, be a, want to, to learn something that's motivating, and I, and I think you'll, it'll be a much richer experience. So it might be another thing to consider. Yeah, I mean, our reasons for turning down reviews might be different from yours. Like we said, you know, ours is probably just lack of time and a lot of times being pulled different directions and too many papers coming our way. But for you, it's probably you know, three or four a year or something. I would encourage you to do as much as you can, but not to take up time away from your work necessarily. But uh, it's, a, it's a good chance to learn. And in our, in our case, it's a good time to mentor, I think. You know, like, if we see a paper we're particularly interested in and think we can contribute to, then uh, definitely take take the review. But uh, the, for the postdocs, it's more a case of balancing your time and between your research and spending a lot of time doing the reviews. But uh, yeah, assuming you're not getting too many coming your way, then I'd recommend you know, do everything you can. Yeah. Um, I'm Liang Zhao from University of Michigan. I have a uh, following up questions about the review process. Um, I understand what your experience as a postdoc to review a paper, but I'm really curious about another review experience of you as a postdoc. Um, how long do you think it's reasonable to expand to spend on reviewing a proposal? Um, so, you know, proposal. Sometimes we are invited as journalists for proposal review. I mean, I'm sorry, a panelist for proposal review panel, and which means we will be given like a seven to you know six to seven proposals to review in um, like time scale of a month. So I really don't know how much time is um, fire range of you know hours or days we should as a postdoc um, spend on reviewing one proposal. Um, shall we take it more serious um, <laughs> than as a paper or you know thank you. In general I think I spend less time reviewing proposals and papers just because they don't have to be ready for publication. I mean, chances are only you and the author and maybe the program manager is ever going to read it. So, and it doesn't mean, you know, I know you learned a lot about proposal writing yesterday, but that doesn't mean a proposal can be worse prepared. I don't know what the correct adverb is there. Can be worse prepared than a paper. It has to be just as thorough as a paper. But I think the review process doesn't have to be as thorough as a publication, just because you really often reviewing a concept, whereas with a paper you're reviewing the, re the results and the interpretation for a publication. So I'd say less, less time in general, especially if you have a whole bunch of them to do. But, uh, but anyway, if you're being asked to be on panel, I'm very impressed. That's excellent. <laughs> Little point. Um, uh, just my own uh, experience. The first time I was asked to the NSF panel, I spent one week panel. I spent another two weeks reviewing all the proposals. <laughs> but I don't think you need to do it. But uh, if this is your first panel, you may feel like you should do a good job, and you can do uh, just. Uh, uh, as much, much time you think you need, but I do agree with what you said that uh, try not to get into so much details because the proposal is different from papers. And just get a whole idea and what they want to do, what's the background, is that new? Just look at those criteria and make your judgment. 
I would say if you're on a panel and you have a bunch of proposals to review, maybe a criterion for deciding how much time to spend is, if you had to get up and talk for two minutes about what that proposal was about, how much would you have? How much time would you have to spend to prepare yourself for that? Because, and, and to critique the idea and and say what's what's good and what's not so good about this particular proposal, because that's kind of what you have to do. You don't have to say, well, that, I don't agree with this paragraph, and that reference isn't quite right, and I mean, it's not that level of detail. But it's being able to, con to see the big picture of this proposal versus an another one versus all you know the other ones that you're considering. So how much time do you need for that? It's obviously less than a paper, and I, I don't know if there's a firm number you can put on it, but that's kind of the idea. Hello, I'm uh, Karen McKinnon, an NCAR ASP postdoc. And my question is about double-blind peer review. So some of the Nature journals in the last year have switched to double-blind review. And I was wondering if in any of the journals you guys are associated with, if there's a move towards that or discussion about it, and generally what you think about the idea of having a double-blind system as opposed to a single-blind system. Thanks. So double blind, you mean so the reviewers don't know who the authors are? Yeah, I, I find it untenable in many ways, you know, because I know everybody in my field. <laughs> so if somebody says I measured this using this instrument, I've got a pretty good idea who it is off the bat. So I don't really see how it can fly in many cases, certainly in observational science. So I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest. Um, I don't, don't necessarily see the advantages of it, really. But uh, I guess some journals are headed that way, really because of funding issues, and I don't really fully understand the history of it. But I guess it's just to avoid, um, you know, I won't say dishonesty, <laughs> but uh, uh, bias among reviewers and that. Yeah. But I, I, I can't imagine it's a great concept, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think the point of it was really to, to try and avoid the unconscious bias, right? Um, because a lot of the time, uh, you know, some, some of the evidence suggests that women are reviewed more harshly than men when it comes to scientific papers, and so it is a, a, an effort to, to reduce bias. So, but I think that Jess' point stands. You know, I think that once you're established in the field, it's very once you see what people have written, there are often so few people writing in each particular subset, it's really hard to not know who wrote that paper. <laughs> so, um, it's a good question, though. Yeah, do you have a follow-up for that? I think that's, that's a great point, and I think what would really be great is if the, the journals who are doing the double-blind system would publish on how that has gone, because that could really then inform um, how other journals go about that, and I would love to see some research on, on, on the papers that go through that system and, and how that works. Sure. Hi, I'm um, North Hadar. I'm a postdoc at NCAR. And um, so finding time to write a paper is difficult. And I was wondering if you had any advice on how to do it. For instance, if you have a routine, a writing routine that you're following, if you write like every morning or maybe every night, or uh, if you actually write, uh, you get the whole study done, then write it down, if you could comment on it. Um. I guess I, I personally, I try to write every day and I try to set aside time. For me, I'm an early riser, so I get up before my kids do and have an hour and a half or two hours where I just work on stuff. Yeah, my students' papers or my own stuff and I just steadily keep, keep writing. <laughs> you just have to start somewhere. Um, and it gets, time-wise, time it gets a lot, lot harder. <laughs> 
Right every day, I agree. <laughs> yeah, mornings or evenings or whatever's convenient for you. And um, I guess at some point, you know, if it really needs to be done, then talk to your advisor and say, I need a block of time. Maybe he'll say to you, you're banned from going in the lab. You've got to <laughs> do this for the next two weeks or whatever. Sometimes that situation occurs as well and just like bang it out. But, you know, get into a routine, think logically about it and go about it in a nice organized way. I guess I would just add, add one more thing to that because I think, um, you know, the further you get along, the more external deadlines are imposed on you, like reviews and proposal deadlines and like service things and all this stuff that other people are telling to you to do by a certain date, whereas writing, nobody else is telling you to do that anymore. So you have to like, if it's a priority and it has to be, you have to set aside time and you have to set aside, have the self-discipline to do it and maybe put it above some of those other things or make it equally important because it's, it's easy because you don't have a specific deadline to let it slide. So I think just making, deciding this is my time to do this and I have to do this every day is, is really important because otherwise it's, it's easy just not to do it. So, I mean, one quick comment before the question on what they were saying is that like, Maybe you guys as senior scientists know everyone in the field, but as a postdoc who's only been working for a few years, probably don't know everyone in the field. So, you know, maybe the editor can know who it is, but as a reviewer, anonymity might be quite useful if we're at our level. Uh, but the question I was going to have was, I've had a, I've had quite a few, I've done quite a few reviews by authors of English as a second language, where I've ended up being probably a lot softer in things like grammar and structure than I would have done if, the, if it was like from an English speaking country. And then end up getting quite frustrated because I you know, write five, six page reviews where I'm just, 90% of my comments are just about language. And it's like, at what point is it acceptable to say, look, please get this proofread and send it back to me? No, just have any comments on that? As soon as you feel yourself getting frustrated, that's when you say, I, I'm not doing this. And sometimes it's useful to just scan the paper and just to get a sense for if this is going to be an issue. I mean, the editor should be doing this also, uh, even before it gets sent out for review in an ideal situation. But I think it's, it's really important for, for people to pr have their papers proofread in the appropriate language of, of publishing, which for most of what we do is English. Yeah, definitely. Don't get frustrated. And I've seen like, reviewers get halfway through a paper, then just stop. So I'm not going anymore with this. Here's detailed comments on the first three pages of the paper <laughs> and send it back, which doesn't really help anybody. And uh, I certainly know that AGU has a proofreading system. Yeah. And, and often I'll even. I've seen papers come in and say, you yeah, know, this has the official stamp of such and such an agency that reads papers, and so um, the authors have taken the trouble to have the paper read and have this kind of seal of approval of what it is that they tell you. But uh, yeah, AGU I know has some uh, service for doing that, and uh, often as an editor, I would send papers back and say, yeah, please have someone look through this as well, um, based on the author's uh, reviewer's comments or just my own reading of it. But uh, yeah, it's not your job to do that. Yeah. Actually, just add on to one point. Uh, do you know uh, for the uh, foreign people, like Chinese, Japanese, and there are some now, it's like there are some professional, uh, some people just doing that. I'm not sure whether you know that. You can recommend as a, if, if you are frustrated, but you think there's good science there, you can say, why don't you ask the authors to go to a professional uh, uh, person who does those. And I have friends doing that too. <laughs> so there are some people, they charge how many words, how much dollars, and they charge that, but you can suggest them to go to that. And it's not just foreign authors, too. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I've often you know, seen somebody on an author list who I know and respect and think, geez, did he really read that? And so <laughs> it's not just that. You, know, you really wonder sometimes if the senior author has even read the paper at times. So <laughs> enough said. <laughs> Um, 
Hi, I'm Lei Chiu Hu, SP postdoc. Um, I have two different questions. Um, the first one is, um, could you briefly describe how you get become the editor of the top um, quality journals? And besides doing good research, um, do you have any um, suggestion for uh, early career scientists to do to make, um, to make us uh, have a bigger impact uh, in our field? Another one is, I want to ask, is, could you br uh, briefly comment, uh, does it necessary to pay extra money to make paper uh, open access? Because uh, we always have a very tight budget, and, I, and, uh, and our position is we can assess most of the database in our field, but I don't know for the uh, audience uh, other, in other field interest in our research. Um, does that we need to uh, worth to pay that a uh, lot of money to to do that? Thank you. I thought this might come up. Uh, um, I, th yeah, I think open access is a great thing. I think a lot of the journals are moving that way, one way or another. I. I it's kind of unfortunate people do have to pay more for open access and you know, often institutional libraries and that can get the papers obviously so I always feel bad if if, if that's you know, a burden on the author over and above publication charges but on the other hand traditional publication charges are getting less and less because everything's online there's not the the paper proof setting typesetting and everything like that that they used to be so you know maybe it, kind of goes around a little bit. And the first question, you know, start doing reviews and then maybe become an associate editor or something, make yourself available. If there's a call for associate editors, then you'll get to handle a few papers, see how the process works, and then eventually, you know, you may get asked to be an editor or there may be an open call, but, uh, you know, it's something to work towards. It's a very valuable thing. And it's, you know, editors don't have to be old and gray either. I think it's <laughs> kind of nice to have a young, dynamic editor on board who has lots of time to spend and lots of energy. And so that's certainly the AGU philosophy with, with GRL for sure. We would try to get a, a fairly young editorial board where people are involved. And so, you yeah, know, don't be put off becoming an editor just because you think you're too young or something. But, uh, but start, yes, start with reviewing and being an associate, then work up from there. I just add on to one point to your second question. Uh, it's only my own opinion, and such as, as you said, the climate dynamics. If you, that's a free journal, and if you don't pay, it's going to take a year, sometimes two years, from online to real publication. I regret it. I didn't pay. <laughs> Why? The reasons are, and that paper was highly cited, but a lot of them cited the online version. Web of Science, they never counted that. You know, that affects your H index. <laughs> and also your total citation number. I really regret it. Only $2,000, $3,000, just like a regular journal. And at that time, I thought, oh, okay, it's free. And, and now I feel I should have done that. It's just my own personal opinion. So just recently, I um, am running an, a session for a meeting this summer, and one of my uh, co-organizers wonderfully got us a special issue in a journal. And so now I'm like, what do I do? What have I gotten myself into? Um, <laughs> how, uh, what is the, the typical process and how does this differ from a normal journal submission? I'm, I'm, most, I'm mostly wondering, are these lightly peer reviewed? Are they held to a different standard? Good, okay, great. What, what is my role going to be in all of this? <laughs> Um, crazy, probably. <laughs> and you, you know, you're going to get a lot of papers, hope, probably coming in at the same time. You usually have a, like a window where everyone needs to submit their papers by, and then a closing date, uh, where, which is usually not terribly hard. There's some flexibility there. 
probably, but you're going to you know, be kind of hit by a whole bunch of papers coming in within a short time, and then you can have to find reviewers for them. But you definitely should hold them to the same standard as normal pa journal papers would. There's no, no reason to think it's a, it's a soft review pr process or anything. Other than that, just you know, same guidelines as usual, but just expect chaos you know, around the closing date when everybody submits the, the thing. And it can be a little frustrating as well, because I've been in a couple of special issues, been an author in special issues, and there's a deadline, and then somebody calls the organize about a month after the deadline. Oh, you know, this guy was my PhD supervisor. I really like to submit a paper. And then you, know, you see things sitting on the ASAP tab of the journal for almost a year waiting for the final paper to come in. So at least with online submission, things do get published in the early publication. And so it's not just sitting around on somebody's desk for a year waiting for that last paper to come in. And. Uh, as well, like with the GRL, the kind of always had you know, floating special issues. Well, they didn't all have to come out on the same day. They'd just be linked online. So it's not that all the papers uh, all had to be published on a certain day. There's just a link in there saying, this is part of the special issue. And you click on here to see the other papers. And atmospheric chemistry and physics does the same kind of thing. There's usually a window, and it could be four years even between the first and the last papers coming in. But I think in your case, where it's a specific conference, then it's going to be a much tighter deadline and everything's going to come in pretty much at once, hopefully. <laughs> My name's Angie Pendergrass. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Ceres, CU now, but I was just at NCAR until a month ago. So um, my question is, uh, when you're writing a paper, how much uh, strategizing should you do about like making statements that reviewers won't complain about, and then thinking about which journal you submit to so you uh, get to an editor that you think is knowledgeable about the topic. Now, the context for this is, um, you know, I've published a few papers now, and um, most of them I've just kind of focused on doing good science and putting together something that makes sense. Uh, but I recently uh, worked with a co-author who spent like inordinate amounts of effort. Like, I think if we submit to this journal, we can get this editor. And I think you really need to change this sentence because I think it's going to flag something for the reviewers. So uh, can you comment on that? It, so the, these are two different issues, I think. Sort of the preemptive writing style, which I certainly don't recommend very much because it will inevitably you know, detract from this key message you're trying to get across. And you're often mistaken about who you think might get it to review. And even if that person got it to review, they might not have any problem with whatever the statement is. And so I think that's more or less a non-issue and I wouldn't, you know, you want to be thorough, you want to be clear, you want to write the paper you want to write and, uh, but the issue of where it goes is important um, because you want the right readership, you want a, be able to probably have editors that know about this topic, etc. I mean, I think that that is something worth carefully considering uh, and so I'd spend time on that, but I wouldn't spend time on the other thing. Um, I, I, I agree with thinking carefully about where you're going to submit it also in terms of the audience that will ultimately see it. Um, I guess I would say one thing about the, um, the first part. Um, I, I think it is always important just to make sure you cite everything <laughs> appropriately, because in some cases you do have a pretty good sense. I mean, it depends on what you're writing for, but you're like, okay, it's very likely one of at least these three people are going to get it, and just make sure you cite one of their papers. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't hurt, as long as it's relevant, and you know, just to think carefully on, on that. You want to make sure you're citing things appropriately, because reviewers get upset if they're not cited, and they think their stuff should be cited. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And um, as I said, I write at the beginning of the session, you know, be, realist, re be realistic about where you're sending it and just don't you know, send everything to nature and science off the bat, <laughs> assuming it's going to get in there because it'll probably get bounced around a little bit. So, you know, if it's really going to change the field, you know, send it to a high profile journal. If not, you know, spend a bit more time, write a longer paper. Again, thoroughness and quality is the most important.
Thank you. So we are out of time. So I would like to say a huge, huge thank you to Becky, Chris, uh, Jeff, and Wei Ching. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. If we can just say thanks. All right. Well, nobody move because we have a break. However, uh, we're starting out with a group photo. So well, as you exit the group photo, we're going to be lining up on the far side next to the elevators. And then our photographer should be up on the balcony and be able to take a group photo. So if you can do that before you go and get any coffee or any, um, any snacks. Thank you all so much.